I started out being, uh, I, I'm a graduate with a computer science and math degree. Um, and uh, so I did my BSc in computer science and math. And uh, by the time I was finished uh, my first degree, I was like halfway through being an associate after it. And um, a good friend, of, so I had a nice job at this insurance company, and, it's, and the job says, uh, you're a trainee actuary, and it's like, uh, you know, really good job and everything. So a colleague of mine that was in the computer science major with me, he got a job as um, a new profession that nobody had ever heard of at the time called an EDP auditor, which is like an IT auditor. And uh, it paid twice what my great actuarial training job was paid. So I said to him, do they have any more positions over there? And he said, yeah. And so that's how I ended up being an IT auditor. So I switched jobs, and I, uh, I still loved math, but I fell in love with computers. And that's how that really became the story. I then worked in um, a, a financial group of companies. We did banks, insurance companies, brokerage companies, and learned a lot. And I then left and uh, went into telecommunications. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, you it was uh, because IT audit was such 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 a new profession. You could be barely, you know, you could be like a 23 year old getting a senior management position because there were no not enough people applying for those jobs anyway that knew what they were doing. So I got one of those jobs as a as a top um, telecommunications company for a few years. And then I went to Ernst & Young to learn about consulting. I didn't stay at Ernst & Young very long, and I started my first company when I was probably just a little bit older than you guys. Uh, at the time, I was about 26 years old. And I started a company that distributed software from our competitors, ACL. <laughs> so I started a company where we were reselling, uh, implementing, and, and doing a lot of stuff with ACL software. And uh, a few years later, we started another company, which was a software development company called Simshore. And Simshore easily was the best experience I ever had worked. Um, it was a small group of us, all that went in our pockets, and uh, took mortgages on our houses and all that kind of stuff. And we started a software company. And with a group of about 12 people at the time, we managed to get on what was called uh, what's called the Gartner Magic Fortune. A Magic Fortune from Gartner says, oh, these are the top players in this space globally. So here we are with 10 people creating software that was um, being recognized by Gartner as one of the, at the time, one of the 11 players in the continuous monitoring space that actually was doing something that made sense. And then after that, uh, Caser came calling, and uh, we did an acquisition, and we started a new vision of Caser that focused on continuous auditing and continuous monitoring. And um, my job now at Caser is a little bit different because uh, I'm chief operating officer, but I have responsibilities right across the whole data analytics space. So some of the products that you have seen before, like Idea and all of that, I have responsibilities across those product lines as well. So that's how I'm here this morning. Is that five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, if you look at my passport, it says my profession is I'm an auditor. Uh, why is it that I still do that? I don't know. But uh, when I put chief operating officer or chief executive officer as I was before, then they sometimes, uh, well, now I have a few gray hairs, so it's not too bad. But like eight years ago, when I had a, a, my passport to the, to, the, to the guy at immigration, and it says chief executive officer, he looked at me, looking at the passport, and like, yeah, I don't believe it. So I just did that. So the next time I was renewing my passport, I just put all it and I put that down. And I don't get those uh, problems anymore. So um, why, is, why I'm starting with that, though, is to say that I really, really like this field. I mean, I really loved it. I, if you, we, when we worked at Ernst & Young and we came in, one of the jobs that I had is I was responsible for doing a lot of the computer forensics work when companies failed. So I had to come in and find out where the money is. 
And honestly, I would feel such excitement when you came in, when the, when the bank or whatever financial institution failed, and you walked in the morning, like it's a group of like five of you, and you walked in, you could see everyone looking at you like, yeah, here are the guys that's coming in now. So you felt like really proud and excited about what you were doing. And, um, and even when we did stuff like uh, penetration testing on the websites, you would be working on a, on a banking site for like three, four weeks. You can't, you can't find any weakness in it. <coughs> and then two o'clock one morning, you wake up and say, crap, that's exactly what I need to be doing. You get up out of your bed, you go into the study, and you're in. And then the next morning, you're in a meeting with all the executives, and you're explaining, yeah, 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 it was easy. That's what they think, but you know, it's like four weeks of work. So that's the thing for me is like, when I look at all the different things that I could have been doing, and even now, what I'm doing now, I still, I enjoy it, but really, I really enjoyed when I was an auditor, and I was chasing stuff every day. That's the thing that I really liked. I liked getting into situations where a company comes to you and they say, the general ledger is just not making any sense, we're missing $50 million what's going on. And then you had to chase it and figure out where it's at. So for me, you know, it's like, there's, I still really like that profession. And that's why the job that I'm in, where we're creating software for auditors, is really exciting. All right, so I assume that um, your, you guys are going to be graduating ah! like soon, like uh, another year or so. Right. Two months. Two months. Okay, how many people are going to be auditors? That's more than that. Okay, that's great. How many people are going to be like uh, in the like chief, like in finance or something like that, or accounting? So what are the rest of you guys going to be doing? <laughs> Starting a new business. Entrepreneurs. No. Tax. Tax. Okay, how many of you are going to be working with like Ernst and Young and KPMG and PwC and so on? Okay, how many of you don't know what the hell you're going to be doing? <laughs> okay, honestly, I have the back, I like that. So, um, you know, you're not alone. When I went to, uh, when I, I knew that I wanted to do math when I went to university, but when I went at the time, I didn't know what else I wanted. And so I ended up in computer science by accident because nobody, nobody else really wanted to do it. So <laughs> it seems strange, right, that you, you could have a situation like that. But that was what it was in those days. All right, all the courses that you're doing about audit, I'm going to put some pictures on the screen, and you're going to start thinking in your mind, which one do you think really represents internal audit today, internal audit tomorrow, and internal audit in, in the distant future? This image, does that look like anything like, is it today, tomorrow, or future? It would be today. What about that one? All fancy charts and computer screens and all of that. All right. <laughs> what about that one? Future. Futuristic, right? Future. Okay. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> That's another image. I don't know what it conjures up, but you know, it looks pretty cool. I was trying to get green instead of blue, but I couldn't find it. Which I'm sorry. And uh, what about that? That's neither current, future, present, anything, right? All right. So, how many persons would say? The future of audit is that. How many people would say this one? One, two, three, okay. What about this? Could be. I don't know what this means, but you can figure you can tell me what you think. Is that the future? Yeah. What about this? Alright. So I don't get it right. There's another image I need to put up here to get some other hands up. But I put the last image on the screen to suggest something to you. That there is a possibility, and I'd like you to try this on. Try this concept on. There is a possibility that in the future, audit, the things that audit do today, 
will be just done by the people in the business on a daily basis as a standard part of what they do every day. All right, let's put it this way. If, there, if internal audit goes into a business today and found out that there were excessive payments being made or duplicate payments being made today, they found it out today, when did it happen? Maybe it happened six months ago, right? Came in, discovered it, you write this great audit report, you feel really good about yourself. Company already lost $3 million, but you feel good about yourself, right? And you know, that entire week when you go home, your girlfriend or your, you know, your partner or whomever is saying, oh, you're in such a good mood, I say, yeah, I found $3 million. Then, somewhere in all of this, someone says, how much of that $3 million could we get back? How much can we recover? And then you are saying, why the hell are you asking me that? That's not my job. My job is to find that there were $3 million that went through the door, right? It's not, not my job to prevent it or recover it. So someone wait, uh, go, goes off trying to recover some of that money. Then there is a concept that CEO is going to get up one day and this is one of the greatest fears for internal auditors, chief internal auditors. They fear that their bosses are going to say to them, could we have prevented this from happening in the first place? And then there is a challenge now. Because in internal audit, we're so obsessed with what it is that we do. What is our domain? Where do we belong? and our independence. But the business says, listen, I paid the internal audit group about three million in salaries last year. If you could have just prevented that alone, you would have paid for yourself. And then what happens is, the business says, can we find a way to prevent that from happening? And if you do that, then you're adding value to the business. And what happens is, we start seeing that these are your auditors. The people who were processing the payment in the first place are the same persons that are making sure the controls are right, making sure everything is working the way that it should, and they become your auditors. How many of you are still planning to become auditors? Okay, I have few, fewer hands this time, but don't be scared. It's all I, all it is saying is that the role that you play is different. I like finding stuff when I was an artist. I like finding that someone made a big mistake and we lost money. I love yeah, that. I, I loved writing those big art reports and I feel proud when I find all of these things that didn't work right. But the truth is that in the past 10 years, the business is asking for more than that. They're asking auditors to be there, closer to when the, where the business transactions are taking place. And to not look at it six months later or a year later, but be closer to when it's happening and make sure the controls are effective. It's just a change in how things are looked at. All right, so let's, how many of you have heard of caseware other than ID? Have you heard of anything else about caseware? No? All right. So let's start to fix that today. OK. So case we're 25 years old today, which means we make, which, which, which makes the company older than how many people in this room? <laughs> One. <laughs> so um, we have been around a while. And the founders of the company are actually accountants. And uh, they started out with a product called the Case Your Working Paper. So they worked in accounting firms, and they were preparing financial statements for clients. And they just found that it was just too difficult to do it. And they created software that made it easier. And they turned around and sold that technology to other accountants that were trying to do the same thing, and made quite a bit of a fortune doing that. So we have about 300 employees, um, in primarily North America, 
UK, uh, Netherlands, we have a few people in China as well. And across the world, this morning, you have about 400,000 people, for users that woke up and use our technology. And of course, we have our fair share as well. So let's, how do you select a company that you want to work for? How do you determine a company that you want to work for? Leaving university today. All right, so highest salary. That's how I chose mine. You don't have to be shy. That's OK. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I did it. Highest salary, OK. Uh, great place to work. Fun, OK. Uh, you see ads on the television for this company. No? Oh, come on. You don't want to go work it for a really popular company? How many want to work for like Google? Or nobody wants to work for Google? <laughs> OK, there, one Google person at the back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, how many of you would love to work for, uh, let's say, <laughs> what's, the, what's, what's the best company that you can think of? Google. OK, other than Google. <laughs> All right, and you, you're all choosing the those big four and so on. But let's say MetLife. You know, you've heard of MetLife all the time, maybe. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Someone says, yeah, give me MetLife. I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, one of the things that I tell you something is, uh, in every, I worked at large telecommunic, I worked at the large telecommunications company. I'll tell you a story, which is really cool. So, it was great because the salary was like phenomenal. I didn't know that someone would pay you so much money to do stuff like that. To work, you know. And, you know, I got this lovely office on the fifth floor and all that kind of stuff. And you got a company car. They don't do stuff like that anymore. So I, mean, I guess I'm dating myself a little bit here, but it's okay. And um, but you know, it was horrible. It was a hard place to work. I got paid very well, but it's a hard place to work because they had such rigid policies about everything. Even the size of my office was written in a policy that says, this, these are the dimensions for a manager at this level. Yes. So they had stipulations around everything. And oh god, it was so frustrating trying to get anything done. I left. I went to Ernst and it was the complete opposite. They were not as organized as I would like them to be at specific or in your location. wasn't as organized as I'd like them to be. So it's like, I was stuck in between two places. So I started my own company, and I created it a particular way. Case where it's not far from what, where I like to be. So these are some statements that we make. We say an integrity statement. We are committed to creating and maintaining a company of the highest integrity. What is integrity? All right, this is a US, I'm not in Canada, so I can say this. It means that you don't bullshit each other. <laughs> All right, in Canada, they have words there from my home, did you say that? But that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but you don't bullshit each other. You, you're working in a team and you're honest with each other. That, that's what it means. And you don't have a lot of onset. You know what onset is? Onset is you're in a meeting. And you see people scheming and and they're not saying anything. And then the meeting ends and they walk out. And all that happens is that they say, hey, you can make any decision they want to make in the meeting. I'm not doing anything. So that's what integrity means, is that you say what's on your mind, you have respect for someone, but you get things done. Another thing, too, is that if we're recruiting, if I were to look at all of you guys in the room, and you come in for an interview for a job today. I wouldn't worry about whether you have first class honors or what your GPA is. I wouldn't worry about that. The fact that you got to me meant that someone already screened you for that. What we're looking for is, number one, integrity. Again, the second one is motivation. Are you motivated? And the third thing, which is so phenomenal in a group like this is capacity. Capacity is you have some persons who they can work for eight hours and don't produce the same outcome as someone doing it for one hour. They have 
They have immense capacity. They can get things done quickly. They can learn new things. And they don't say, oh, this is my job. I don't do anything else. Right? That is what, that's what I mean. What that means is that even at my level, if we are going to a con, if we go to a conference and we're setting up the booth and the booth is not is late or something turns up late, then I take off my jacket, I roll up my sleeves, I set up the booth. That's what it means. You do what you need to do. And understanding, understanding what you're doing, how you can get results. What is missing from those two things that you always hear everyone talk about when they're looking for people to hire? What's missing? Qualification. It's blatantly missing. And another one, experience. You see that? No experience. Why is it that we are careful of hiring people with too much experience? It means that their way of thinking, the way that they see things, does not conform to the crazy people that they're going to work with. Right? So if we're looking for someone to do marketing, they're going to want to come in and they're going to want to see everything looking just perfect, the way that it worked at midlife. You know? <laughs> And I'm going to say, no, we don't have things perfect, but you can still get things done. So it depends on what you're looking for. So here's another thing. How do we get results? We get results not by me walking around with a big stick every day and saying, are we hitting the deadline? No, yes. No. It is four developers working on something, and one, and they will have sleepless nights if they think that they want a single developer will, will have a sleepless night if he thinks his code is going to break the whole thing. You know who is he, who is he scared of? Not me. He's scared of the other developers besides him. His peers. That's what he's, he's accountable. That's who he is actually accountable to. Those are the people that he's accountable to. So as, a, as an organization, that's who we are, that's how we operate, that's how we get results. Really nice place to be, nice place to work. Yeah, every company that comes in here is gonna show you all these logos. Yeah, we have all these customers. Um, you already know that, that's fine. Two divisions in the case here. I'm gonna stand here because I don't have a clicker. So we have two main divisions. The first division that started the company we do financial reporting and engagement management. What that means is we assist companies through their financial reporting, and we help the CPA firms when they're going to do that, how to manage an engagement. And the second, sorry, the second division that I'm involved in is data analytics, <laughs> which is like um, a really cool place to be because today it's we could have a just memory stick and we could put like crazy amount of data on it, where 10 years ago, you would probably need a storage device the size of this room to do it. So it's, technology is just driving so many changes, it's really a nice place to be um, working at the time. On the financial reporting side, this is where Rod asked me to talk a little bit about, he, he said, talk a little bit more about what you guys are doing with working papers and financial reporting. So is that okay? I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this that about the analytics side of things, okay? So, <clears throat> there are some challenges that you'll, you'll face as a chief financial officer. You, you'll have, um, you might be, I guess if you're, if you're going into work at, at um, you know, Nike or wherever, you know, so I'm finding more big names to call, Nike and so on, they'll have a lot of this automated but not all of you are gonna be involved in those companies. Some of you are gonna work for smaller companies, mid-sized companies as well. And what you'll find is that you'll have multiple sources for your financial reporting. So you might be using Microsoft Dynamics as a ERP system. In some instances, you might still be using our financials or even SAP, it doesn't matter. You get all of these systems that you're using. But you are getting financial reporting data from multiple sources, many sources, every day. 
And you know what happens is that your board of directors say to you, I want to see my financials four days after the period close or something like that, or two days, and everybody wants to see like tomorrow. You know? And what happened is you're getting disparate data from all these different financial reporting systems, and you need to take that and put it in a way that makes sense. Almost all of you will end up in companies that they ask you to do that in Excel. And that's when you work 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day jobs, when financial period are closing, and then you're doing that kind of job now. Financial period close, and you're just like, oh, you're just, nobody works in public school now. Anybody worked in like a financial, in a finance department before? And when the period close comes around at once, it's just like really busy. Oftentimes, it's just putting all this data together. And that's when you end up in Excel nightmare. So you end up in Excel nightmare because you have all these systems coming across, and you have to take all that data and put it together. What we do is we allow you to get all that information and prepare your financials in one consistent way all the time. So you do it once, and the next month, you don't have to change anything. It automatically generates this. Stuff. So you're not talking about having your financials ready four days after the period close. You'll have something ready anytime that you want. Of course, you have to go through and do the necessary journal entries and whatever, but that's kind of what you're looking at. So the, the division that I'm responsible, that I'm responsible for and um, I can speak a little bit more knowledgeably about this, is uh, we do Caser um, IDEA, which is uh, the foundation of our analytics platform. Um, Caser IDEA is really cool technology, easy to use, and so on. Some of you have been using it. Well, all of you have been using it. Hopefully, it has been a pleasant experience using it. <laughs> um, what we, where we are now as a company is that we're moving, we're changing our direction a little bit though, and we're looking more at an enterprise play where data analytics are concerned. Um, the case for ideas, traditionally done very well, uh, has over like 200,000 users and so on. But it's, um, it, 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 looked, it fits into a certain niche play, but there are large opportunities outside of that. So give you an idea what we're looking at. These are the different areas that we participate in, in terms of financial reporting, um, engagement management. We also have a risk management uh, like an online uh, platform where persons share risk information. Um, <clears throat> and then on the analytics side, we do IDEA. There's a server platform that allows people to collaborate when they're doing data analytics. But there's another product that is really um, Pool, which is called Smart Analyzer. And what Smart Analyzer does is that it allows you to give your audit to predefined analytics and they go out into the field. And when you get data, they can map the data into um, the way the analysis that it needs to get that needs to get done, and it just automatically produces all the results for you. So it produces, so like you're doing your, your aging um, analysis a while ago, looking for maybe <coughs> credits or you know, things like that. All of that would have been predefined. You go, in, you go to another customer, you just map the fields into it, and then it produces the results with all the annotations, the notes, the risk documentation, and everything. So why, why is that important? It is important because you want to get an auditor to go into a customer site today and have results today, not spend two weeks Connecting to data, figuring out what to do, doing analysis, same analysis that they did last year, over and over again. You don't want that to happen. So you want them to come in and just be able to get results right away. The other side of that too is, as we go beyond that, and getting the auditor to be the persons that are actually doing the work, that's when now we get into continuous monitoring. So you go into a situation, you do these analysis of your accounts receivables today, and you found those problems, right? 
But some of those exceptions could have occurred six months ago, going back to the original problem. A little bit too late, right? So what we're doing is that we can automate all of that where we're continuously looking at those transactions. And when the transactions are not what they should be, any type of anomaly or anything, we will raise alerts and put on a remediation workflow on top of it to get the, the exceptions resolved. So the exceptions are resolved before they impact the business. So let's just go quickly through this. <coughs> For the case of working papers platform, what we do is that we're taking data from multiple sources. It could be a dump from your accounting software. It could be uh, we're taking something from Excel. We always get tons of stuff in Excel. Um, in some instances, we're even getting data in like an XBRL format. You all know what XBRL is? Um, from that, we can create a trial balance now. The way that you create the trial balance is determined by what accounting standards are being used. So what we, have, what we do in our platform is for financial reporting is that we allow anyone to create a template. And the template says, this is how you need to do the financial reporting. So if, it's, um, if you're in, say, Indonesia, and there's a specific way that you need to do the financial reporting, there's a template for the uh, for Indonesia reporting standards. If you're in the US and it is IFRS, then there's a template specifically for that. If you're looking at uh, government in terms of municipalities, there's a specific way that they do it as well. So there's a template that fits all of that. And, um, and once we go into one industry and we do it that way, we make those templates available. So you don't have to figure it out again. What we, what we do is we map your financial data. So we will take, say, cash, petty cash from multiple sources. It could be that um, these records are being maintained in separate systems. It could be one system. But for your financial reporting, you are not required to have multiple accounts on the financial report. You're not required to have a petty cash, a cash in domestic, a cash in foreign. You just need to have what is your cash value. And what we do is that we map all of those figures into the financial reporting entry for cash. And when you do that, then it consolidates on our side onto the balance sheet. So it knows where to put it and everything. So you don't have to worry about all of that. So what this means is that when you go in to do an audit, when you do it, sorry, not an audit, when you go in to prepare financials, all you're really doing is mapping source to the template. And the template takes care of everything else, including the notes to the financials, everything. So all of those things are standardized and you never have to touch it. So going back to this, after you've done the mapping and you have the accounting um, area standardized, then we also provide you with a whole bunch of other stuff that helps you with what you're doing in that, in that engagement. When the, when the auditors are, when the uh, financial accountants come in and they're preparing your financials, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens. So we also provide you with the ability within our application to do the journal entries and everything. And at the end of it, we pass it back to you and say, you need to pass these journal entries at source. So we, we take care of that as well. Um, in addition to that, we also deal with like all the engagement documents. So whatever documents that you provide to us, we store that so we have a document management platform. We can control who sees what, who does what. We do it for tax as well. Somebody said that they were looking at getting into tax. Right, so in terms of tax compliance, um, we, uh, we, we facilitate all of those reporting as well, all the regulatory reporting around that, and we integrate with standard tax applications as well. So normally, when someone is using case or working papers, they just choose a template. So they choose a financial reporting template, they map the data in, and then it automatically generates the financial statements. So they don't have to do anything beyond that. And so, the notes are already there, but if they want to add more notes, they can do that as well. 
And then in terms of like uh, your whatever, if you're using a tax package, a separate tax application, then we will export that application to that tax package so that you can determine how you're doing the tax returns. So all of that is automated. There's an interesting project that we're doing. Um, I'm just skipping a few slides uh, just to make sure that we're finishing on that. Um, there's an, a really cool project that we're working on now called the Caseware Club. And what that is, is um, we're using, we're allowing companies to submit their accounting data according to a specific standard. All right, so for example, in Germany, how do you go about doing your, your, um, your financial statements and your returns? There is a standard that is defined by, government, by the German government that says, this is how you need to provide the data. So there's a standard scheme for that data. When that data is provided, we can take that data and generate your standard financials. But not only that, but we can generate concerns or issues based on what we see here. So what we have created is a product, a cloud-based product called Caseware Collaborate. And Caseware Collaborate, what it does is that it, it, it allows the company, if it's being say it's being audited by BDO, BDO would say, submit your data using this platform. They submit the data on the platform. And automatically we go through and we assess everything. We assess what has been submitted, is it correct, is it balanced, are there any concerns with it? If there are any issues with it, we push back to the, to the end customer and say, hey, these are some of the problems that we're seeing with what we submitted. You need to take a look at this. And then there's a collaboration that goes on between ourselves and the end customer that allows us to you know, finalize what those financials are. These are the same standards that are being introduced in many other European countries. So in the Netherlands, it's the same thing. It's kind of way in which you provide your audit data. So all we're doing is providing a club. And, and the truth is that in a lot of instances, what you would have seen in the past is that persons were not willing to provide financial data in a cloud platform. But that has gone away. A lot of the concerns and fear around the cloud has just passed off. And there are a lot, a lot of people that are willing to provide this type of information now. And what we're seeing is, we're seeing a lot of public accounting firms that are moving onto this platform just rapidly. So the, the, level of, the level of subscription that we're seeing moving onto this platform is, is quite amazing. And, in truth, um, this part of the case for a business is, you know, in terms of the financial reporting and engagement management, is probably uh, the, the part of this is growing the fastest. All right, so that's enough for our financial management and engagement and so on. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, I think last year we had uh, provided um, you guys with licenses for working papers. Have you started? like introducing some of that in the curriculum? Um, yeah, I haven't started now, but in the next few weeks we will do it. Okay, yeah. great, great. But it's, um, my, both, both companies uh, that I started, I use BDO as my audit firm, and this is the technology that they use, and this is what they've always used. And in fact, 75% uh, of the public accountants worldwide, this is a platform that they use. So it's, a, it's very, well captured in terms of uh, in terms of that, the big four tend to use some of their own stuff, but that's different. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about what we're doing with the analytics part of things. Um, let's start at where we're getting data from, because none of this is possible if we can't get data. So we have standard ways in which we get data, <laughs> and so there's a, a process through which we, we do that. For an individual user, what we provide is case for ID. So this is you as an individual person on your laptop or whatever. You're using case for ID. You can do the analysis, all the great stuff that you 
people see. So when I used to teach a lot of people to use data analytics, they'll say, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do that? And, I, and my response is, if there is data and you can conceive it in your mind logically, then idea can do it. Yeah, that's the like, easiest way to answer it. It's just that you have to figure out how to do it, but it can be done, right? So we provide these tools for the individuals. Why is it that if you looked at some of the stuff that you were doing before, just being able to profile the data, summarize the data, stratify, classify, all that kind of stuff, it's really very useful because you gain insights and then because of the interactive data, the, sorry, the interactive nature of the tool, you don't have to think it all the way through. You just need to start, get insights, and then based on the insights, you can figure out what to do next. So when you were looking at the example there, you didn't necessarily know that there were credits in, it, in there, right? But when you did the analysis, you saw that, and then it triggered in your mind, oh, I need to look at that and see what's going on there. And that is how the tool is intended to, use, to be used. But we also realize that there's another concern. If I worked at Nike, would they be okay with me having off a lot of their financial data on this laptop right here today? Showing their sales, their customers, you know? <laughs> what, if, you know what if I work for like a big investment company or an investment broker? And we have all our customer data right here with your balances and your investments. You're be very happy. No. And that's the challenge with using the desktop tools at the same time. There is a lot of privacy issues around, issues around data and so on. So what you do is that you provide a server platform where the data stays in a secure environment, but you can use the ID desktop, connect to that, and do the same analysis, just as if it were on your laptop. But it is not on your laptop. And one of the things that, I, that we do with the server platform is that we say we have a, what we call a server-only mode. And what that means is that no data can leave the server and go to someone's desktop. It's not possible. There's no functionality that allows you to do that. All right? Another thing, too, is that you provide a collaborative platform to do analysis. So if I did something and I think, wow, that's pretty cool, I'm able to share it with someone else and say, hey, take a look at that. And when you're using it, you actually, you really don't, until you start to collaborate, you don't realize that you're using a separate platform. It, it looks just as if you're using your desktop. So that works pretty good. And of course, when you can start putting data on a server, it means that you're going to get some better performance and so on. So if you're trying to go through like 60 million transactions on your desktop or your laptop, that's going to be challenging. But if you put it on, a, on one of the servers, those are things that you can do. Okay? So that's it. Something like that. Then in terms of the business, and internal audit is mentioned in that, what we do is that we provide case reminder, which now positions it in terms of saying, this is the business, this is how we add value. We provide a continuous auditing platform, a monitoring platform as well, and uh, <coughs> But you know, the truth is that the way that we have seen people use this technology is not quite how we thought it would be used. We thought that we would have primary auditors using this and so on. We have customers that are using the same continuous monitoring auditing concept for business in a very clear, distinct way. I'll give you some examples. Uh, we have an energy company, and every day what they do is that they use the analytics and the monitoring to pick up the new bills that are running in night, double check and make sure everything is okay before they process, before they, those bills are processed. If of the 30,000, 40,000 bills, they find 20 bills that are incorrect, they push a small file, if I say XML, maybe XML is not okay. like a small file to the bill print company who takes it and know that they should print all the bills except those. And then they route that now to a unit called a bill verification unit, and they investigate it. That's business. That is 
And that's what I'm saying. They're doing auditing, but they're doing it as a part of doing good business. Why is that important for them? One incorrect bill can cause you no end of frustration in terms of bad publicity. So, for example, that customer, some years ago, sent a, 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 sing, a single one of their um, subscribers a bill for $10,000. The bill is normally like $80, $60, right? So what would happen, and I do, I shouldn't, but I do, when those, when those bills come into my account, it just automatically takes the money out. Because I don't want to have to deal with the bill. I don't want to have to take it and pay it. So I have a thing where it's pre-authorized to, to be paid from my account. So if I get a bill for $10,000 today, close to pay day in my current account, what's going to happen? I'm gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a mess, like, but in this case, what happened is, there's a gentleman that got that bill, and just wiped out his, his card account. So, his mortgage didn't go through, none of his other utility bills went through, nothing else went through. So it was a big thing in the press. For that utility company, is it about the money, or is it about the bad publicity? It's the bad publicity that they are now gonna have to deal with, right? Because all of a sudden, you know, everybody's at their office saying my bill is wrong, <laughs> you know, or something like that. So you don't want to get into that. Or we have other situations where we have seen a lot of compliance groups using this technology as well. A lot of reg for regulatory compliance, anti-money laundering, um, uh, sometimes uh, like sanctions, the screening, making sure that you're not doing business with terrorists, things like that. So this is kind of the way that the technology has evolved. It's just not quite what we were thinking in this industry. But it's, it's quite um, exciting. So idea, you already know what it does. I don't need to go to this slide, right? You all know what it does. You all know it's great. Yeah, great. great, great. <laughs> um, I can't, I can't if I were to go back to university, I never thought any tool I was using was great. You know, I always thought that it sucked. Uh, and, um, and that was because, you know what? The, at that stage of your life, you, your expectations of things are very different. Which is often why we recruit most people straight out of university, because you see things differently. And things that we think are OK, you, you often say, no, it's not OK. And that's how we get such phenomenal improvement in product over time. The enterprise play, which is the server, what, we are, what we're saying is don't have the, the data sitting on your desktop. You're going to be connecting a, a lot of um, users to this single platform, and they're doing their analysis there. But they're not necessarily moving back they're not moving any data back to any of those desktops. And that's important. So one is that we have a secure way of taking data from the source system, whether it's SAP or whatever, putting it on an ID server right here. And here we can have all the collaboration we want. So you could do analysis when you're doing the audit, like a group of people doing an audit, they can work on the same files, they can collaborate, they can make comments, they can make audit notes, everything on the same data file altogether. And again, when you're using it, it doesn't appear that you're using something on a server. It just looks as if everything is on your desktop. Uh, the continuous monitoring platform, uh, what we're doing is the same thing, taking data from multiple sources. It's probably not a great way to see the, the image. But, we're taking data from multiple sources. Why is that important? No matter how a company believes that they're using, they, they spend $30, $40 million to just have this one platform for everything called SAP or Oracle, oftentimes they still have a lot of other systems that they're using that are critical. So you have to be able to get data from multiple sources. Why is that you have to do that? All right, let's say that um, 
I'm interested in knowing if there is a potential conflict of interest. Right? And last year I used a scenario and I said one person in the class is married to another person in the class and she wasn't very happy, so I won't do it this year. So um, let's say that. Um, oh, the name tags are all turned on, but. Uh, Caitlin. Okay. So let's say Caitlin is married to someone not in this class, and his name is Mark, right? And, and I, I hope I didn't accidentally say the right name, but yeah. So she's married to this guy named Mark. And uh, they, Mark has a, a trucking company, right? Called ABC Truck. And uh, so Caitlin is the purchasing manager, or stores manager, and uh, they have to get truckers to come and move the goods and everything, right? <laughs> One of the things that you're interested in is making sure that Caitlin is not hiring her husband to do the trucking without disclosing the relationship. Because if you do that, there's a potential conflict of interest where you can have collusion, and all of a sudden, this trucking company gets paid four times what someone else gets paid to move items from one location to another, right? So when we're doing that, what we tend to do is we look at the vendors on the system, and we look at all their demographic, their information, their name, addresses, telephone numbers, all of that. And what we do is that we go to another system which has all your HR information, and we pull that in as well, and we cross-check it. Two different systems, we pull everything in, and we cross-check it. So am I seeing Caitlin and Mark with the same telephone number, the same address, the same bank account? If I see anything like that, then I raise a flag and I say, here's a potential, rela here's a potential related party situation. They are potentially related. And I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just raising it. And when I raise it, I send it to whatever division deals with that ethics and whatever in the company. And they should have on file a declaration from Caitlin that says, ABC Trucking Company is owned by my husband. So my wife um, worked at, as, uh, as head of risk and compliance for this insurance company. And my, my company did a lot of work with them. And she had to declare every year that she's a director in my company. She had to declare how many shares she had, what level of equity, stakeholding, all that kind of stuff had to be clear, very clear. Otherwise, she could get fired for not declaring. So if that's a control that's in the business, then this is how we would use analytics to test that control to see if it's working. Okay? And of course, Caitlin would have declared properly and said, Oh, I have a loving husband, Mark, and he has this great company, ABC Trucking, and I'm so proud, and so on and so on. So let, let's talk a little bit about continuous monitoring. Let's, let's do this, right? So there's a company called Sasmo Incorporated, and we do business with your, with your company. We send in an invoice and it went to the guy in green called Michael. He receives it, he puts, puts it on the system today, day one. On the third first day, I call up and I say, what's going on? I sent in my invoice for third days, now it hasn't been paid, what's, what's happening? Michael is on vacation, so I'm talking to Richard. Richard says, I don't know. Send the invoice again for me, please. I, didn't, I don't see it. I don't know Richard may be blind. He may went on the system, probably didn't know how to use the system. He went on, didn't find it. So I send an invoice. I send an invoice again. However, this time, 30 days has gone. I now add a penalty for late payment on the invoice, so the amount has changed, right? Amount has changed, and in addition to that, for whatever reason, maybe I'm just a 
small company and I don't have this fancy ERP system. So I just put a dash zero one or something like that at the end to say this is a replacement invoice. And I thought that was pretty cool. They'll know that this is a replacement invoice and all that kind of stuff. But what happens is Richard receives it and Richard enters it on the system with dash zero one. Oracle Financials look at it and say, oh, this is a different invoice. The amount is different. The invoice number is different and puts it on the system again. So now I have two invoices on the system. And on the 30th day, the first invoice is paid, right? And five days later, the second invoice is paid. So SASMO has now been overpaid $230,000. As an auditor, you'd love to find this, right? So I did say, yeah, I found something really fantastic that will pay for my salary for a year, hopefully not two, or I'm underpaid, or <laughs> something like that. So you're really excited. But this is what the trend, this is what is happening in, in this business, right? Yeah, I think I explained why it wasn't detected, so that's fine. So let's look at the timeline. Day one, Michael did it. Richard entered the, the, the duplicate. 35th day was paid. At this point, you still have not lost any money, okay? But here's when you start losing money. Day 40, you just lost $230,000. By the way, this is like simple, simple duplicate payment scenario. So you can get all technical with me. You're all brilliant. So you get all technical and you say, oh, that couldn't happen, and so on. Don't worry about it. Let's it happen in this case, right? <laughs> However, if you were using continuous monitoring, then what would have happened? On the first day, Michael got it, he entered it, that was okay. On the third first day, Richard entered it. Wow. When he enters it, you can write analytics in IDEA or ACL or any of these tools that says if this invoice number and this invoice number appears to be similar within certain criteria, or you can start stripping out suffixes and things like that. There's a, there's a whole science to looking at duplicated invoices, right? You can do that. And you could also say, and if the amounts are within a certain range, then it is a potential duplicate. You're not saying it is a duplicate, you're saying it is a potential duplicate. So what you do is you issue, you, sorry, you issue an alert. Right? You issue an alert. Who does that alert go to? Then it could it could have gone back to Michael or Richard Bob. No, you could also go to the, the manager in the, like a purchasing manager. Go to the purchasing manager. So the purchasing manager is here today in a meeting and pops up on his screen is an alert that says, there's a potential duplicate payment going on in your department. Wake up, let's get it sorted out. Let's say the purchasing manager is on vacation. Then after one day, you could have escalated it to someone else. So you escalate it to Margaret, who is in the audit department. And Margaret says, oh, what is going on? Why didn't the purchase manager react to this thing? Oh, importantly, this is the most important thing on this screen, right here. You haven't lost any money, okay? And so, Margaret goes on to the purchasing manager and says, hey, where is Marlon? Why didn't he react to this thing? What's going on? Oh, Mar Marlon is on vacation. He says, okay, well, there's a problem here. And then everyone realizes what was going on. And went in, canceled the first invoice, because the second one is correct, because you did not pay within 30 days, you, so you, are, you incurred a penalty. So you canceled the first one. So you cancel the first invoice and pay the second one. How much money did you lose in this situation? Nothing. If you were to do this audit a year later, how much money would you have lost? 
That's the difference between periodic auditing and continuous monitoring. Very simple example, okay? So, KPMG, anyone works at KPMG? Going to work at KPMG? Already has a job at KPMG? No, not yet. KPMG did a, a broad survey and they said it takes almost a year to detect something like this. And in nine, and by the time that you detect it, 90% of it is on the cover. So it's easy to pay out money, it's hard to get it back. So the thing is, it doesn't, it makes business sense for you to the same things that you would do in that annual audit, just do it more frequently. That's a very basic concept, right? So, what I'm going to do is to just uh, talk a little bit about, show you, because you have used the idea and see what it looks like. I don't have working papers on my system, but I do have a few screenshots as to how we approach. Um, continuous monitoring, I'll, I'll just share it with you. How we look at continuous monitoring is that we always start with what's going on in the business. So, many of you will realize that uh, if, when you're going to audit, you're all going to want to get up and fire up your ID or your ACL licenses and start doing analysis, right? Because that's what seems exciting. But there's a boring part of audit that requires you to understand what it is that you're auditing. <laughs> And for continuous monitoring, it's the same thing. You have to understand what it is that you are monitoring. And so you have to kind of go in a little workshop and assess where the risk and controls are. And so within our application, Case or Monitor is like a web-based application. And what we do is that we, we generate all the alerts back to the end users. So in this situation, what would have happened is um, the purchasing manager would have gotten an alert right here. So it come up as a, as, a, as a notification. So he'd be able to, to, to react to it right away. And then what we do is that for every single control that you have, that you're monitoring, we allow you to define those controls within the application. So here, this is a, the one that we're doing for duplicate payments. And then we design analytics that test that control. After we have done that, then this is what we do now, where we define remediation. Remediation is very important because you do realize that detecting that there was a duplicate payment, right? There is just part of the puzzle, right? It's only a part of the puzzle. What, I, what I'm saying is, it's all when the reverse have detected that there was a duplicate payment. But if we did not engage the purchasing manager, who probably was asleep or on vacation, who didn't react, and then we chose to then engage the audit manager. If we didn't do that, would we have been able to get the right results? So the remediation process is very important. You have to be able to escalate things to a number of different levels at times to get the right results. Once you have done that too, what you also want to know is you want to document everything as it happens. So when the audit manager receives it, she would say, hey, I am, I am contacting the purchasing manager to find out what is going on, full stop. Put a comment on it. She contacts purchasing. She says, oh, she will come back and says, well, purchasing man manager Marlon was on vacation. So now I'm getting Richard to cancel the first invoice. So you'll see all of that. So you'll see the whole thing happening. And as it is closed out, then we close it out in the system as well. In, 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 the, uh, in our work, the way that we set up the, the, the workflow, the remediation process, it's all dynamic. So you can just create anything that you want to create in terms of the workflow, all graphical as well. And then you have your notification system. So the notification system, we keep all notifications that came to you, almost like email. And all of it is there. Everything that's done on the on the on the on the, the exception is logged. Everyone that touches it is logged. Everything is kept, including attachments um, or any files that you want to attach to. And all the analytics that are running, all of the analytics, we monitor those analytics and make sure that nothing fails. 
Why is that important? That's important because if you have a situation where you're supposed to be monitoring these duplicate payments and that analytic fails or is turned off, then those duplicate payments can occur and go through the door and you are thinking that you're okay and you don't know that you're not okay. So that's important as well. All right? So in summary, case where these are, these are places that we operate in. We, um, we're really very strong in the whole financial reporting market. Uh, we, if you go to anyone outside of the big four and you talk to them about what they use, there's a very high percentage, 75% to be exact, likelihood that they'll say to you, this is what we use for to prepare financial statements. Um, this is a very creative and innovative group um, they're based in Toronto, and they really go out there and create a lot of cutting edge stuff all the time. So, uh, if any of you uh, looking at a job in Toronto, if you want to relocate, I don't know why you would, but yeah, uh, that's somewhere that you could apply to. And then, in terms of the, the analytics side of things, I think uh, some of the innovation that is really cool is like Smart Analyzer is really, really a good product. Um, because it allows you to just go on-site with stuff predefined and you can just get results right there. So you don't have to go through the tedious process of knowing what to test, how to test it, and then when there is an exception, what to do. But in terms of long-term uh, innovation, I think that what we're doing in terms of um, continuous monitoring and wider risk and compliance areas, I think that those are probably where we're going to be focusing a lot in the future. All right, so questions about anything before I ask Mr. Kanjani to replace me. Oh, I have a few questions. How long is it for us to start to the church? How many activities do you have? How do you want to do that? Let's see, today's day, use the one that says workers in the end. There's not the one that says contemporary. That's a good question. So Richard is saying, why didn't we push the exception to the manager and not to Richard himself and say, Richard, there's a problem here? Um, you could send it to Richard as well. You could. In some instances, it depends on whether or not we think Richard is making a mistake or is intentionally creating a If Richard is intentionally creating a mistake, then sending it back to Richard is like going back to the person that created it first place and you'll just say, oh, it's fine, and close it out, and you still lose more than 30,000. When you send it to the manager, you're, for that to still happen, then you're going to have to be collusion between each other. Another thing that we do is that, you see, in that situation, we actually analyze the data, go back and analyze the data, and make sure the duplicate has to be resolved. Meaning that there's a way for you to configure it in our system that says, um, we call it uh, an auto-close. An auto-close is where we go back and examine the control itself and make sure that it's actually not still in the system. And only then will it close. So the end user will get a notification that you cannot close it because of the same issues. Right? But that's a good question. You know what else? Um, Transposing of numbers as one thing. 
there's another way that ha this happens more frequently than others too. It's like you create a SAS incorporated twice on the system on the two vendor, vendor IDs. And so when the invoice comes in, it ends up being placed on both vendors. And then the ERP system, as far as it's concerned, is two separate vendors sending in invoices. But in addition, and I'm not quite, in addition, there is there is other factors that come into play. For example, if that vendor was providing you with goods and services that were going into your inventory, then there's also the concept of a three-way match. What you're being invoiced, did, did you actually receive that? So the, the, the vendor could send in three invoices for the same thing, however many times he wants to. But in most situations, you'll still only get paid once because you're reconciling what you receive in your inventory as opposed to what it is that you see you're getting the invoice for. So there are more systems that are set up to do a lot of that. What the continuous monitoring platform is doing is looking for other not so standard ways of any of the duplicated payment. Is that a question? No one else? So, Howard is asking uh, for the six steps that we have uh, in the preparation of the financial statements and then submitting your tax information. He's asking how does that integrate with the cloud environment, um, looking at the volume of data and so on. That yeah. All right, well, in terms of the, the, the volume of data, it's not, it's not like we're moving at a terabyte of data for the preparation of financial statements. Um, and as you, you would also realize, based on how you're using it in these days, that to get a lot of data streamed up into like the cloud environment is not what it is. It's not the difficult to say that it's years ago. Um, like, uh, some of you will notice that, like today, Playing something on YouTube and it, it like it's stopping because the, the bandwidth is not good is almost unheard, right? But you're 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 not that young that you would know five years ago trying to play something on YouTube, what would happen. So in terms of bandwidth, availability of data, uh, being able to push it all the way uh, up into the cloud environment, most of that today is quite seamless. Moving the, moving the data up is, is something that you have to do before. So it has to be before that first step. So you move the data up into the power environment, and then the only when the data is there, and you know what temp, and then you choose your temp, and then you map the data. So there is an assumption in all of this that you would have already prepared the data that you want to map into the financial report. Okay. I'm just curious about the last Sunday, Audit work can be done by the software automatically. There's no need for audit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is some. Um, every I've heard this question like all my life. We hear this question, right? So you'll hear things like, um, so there's going to be a day that everyone can type their own letters, so you don't need typists anymore. And that's right because my son is typing. He's four years old, years old, like being able to use four. I still can't do it by the way, like one hand time. But uh, yeah, some jobs will go. I don't think internal audit jobs will go, it will just change. It's very important to depends on our career choice. <laughs> it, it is, it is. I think Jason, who is still in that profession, probably Jason could add something to that. Don't, don't worry. Plenty of work. I assure you that you have the job drive. Let's stay there until we're done. Tools and opportunities, there's more work. And you could do that work in audit. You could also do that work on the finance or the business side. Because it's more than just doing this in internal audit or external audit. 
because we actually used to be in an audit, and now we're working with the CFO doing similar type of work, which is more proactive and more on the monitoring side, using all of these suites of tools. So there's, there's no lack of work, I, I assure you. So you're choosing well in your professional choice. <laughs> The, the big benefit for uh, an internal life choice as a career at this stage of your career is that you get to learn about so many things. Like if you were to just go into a job today as, um, say, a financial controller, then that's what you're seeing for the next five years. If you go into internal life, especially if it's a good firm, you could be working like three different industries and you can get familiar with 15, 20 different business processes over the next five years, which is invaluable in the future. I mean, if, if, you, if anyone, if you need someone that has worked in my life and they've been able to do that, they can talk to you about insurance, they can talk about people about banking, manufacturing, retail. There's no other, I don't know of another profession <laughs> that allows you to get that type of experience. All right. Well, we're almost out of, well, I'm out of time, so I'm going to thank you guys for sitting and listening and didn't doze off too badly yet. Yeah. So, so thank you very much. Okay, now let's welcome the, uh, Ms. Mac and Jamie uh, to talk about some uh, current issues of the continuous monitoring. Um, we've been used to work in the uh, CPA for and now he is the CEO of his own company. Okay. So uh, uh, Andrew started out talking a little bit longer uh, about himself. It's my fault. Um, this young professor I met a long time ago, Nicholas Vazzarelli, uh, told me that one of the things that you guys like to hear is a little bit about how we got to where we are. Um, so our career progression, so that you can daydream today about all the wonderful things you'll do next and next, next, right? So, so next you get a degree and you get to hang it on the wall and nobody will ever be able to take that away from you. It's a wonderful thing. So you're all happy little people now, or young people. Some of you some of you did, but you're all young. Um, so I did the same. I Actually, the slide that I used that starts off said, saying that I was born in Brooklyn is all Nicholas's fault. So if you don't like this kind of an introduction, tell him. Uh, because he encouraged it a long time ago, and I, I think I think it, it's helpful to you. Uh, ancillary, I'm, I am going to talk about uh, analytics. Um, what's wrong with this slide, or what's what? What might make you think something's odd here? A lot of titles. <laughs> what did you say? A long title. <laughs> Been a little weird. I was like just 10 years ago, not even. I was uh, CEO of a fashion company going to fashion shows in Florence and selling women's shoes and handbags. Um, you know, a little odd that I'm here talking about continuous monitoring and analytics. You might sit there and say, well, he's got nothing better to do. Um, the truth is that I actually do a lot of things right now, and it is a little odd, and that's why I think it's worth explaining. I started out my career uh, with no money. as a kid in Brooklyn that wanted to make some money. I had this big interest in business. So even though you're going to be a tax person and you're going to start out as an auditor and some of you are going to do something else, and, and um, I'm envious of people like Andrew who have computer science degrees mixed into what they're doing. Uh, I started out just as a little kid that wanted to be in business. And the, the green part is to make some money, right? Uh, the path I took, as you're going to see in the next four slides, took me through IT auditing. Uh, very similar to your, I wanted to work for a public accounting firm, Dick Wilson, the professors here tell me all the time, all you want to do is pass the CPA exam, get a job with Ernst & Young and, or one of the big firms, and that's, an, that's a good place to start, as you were just talking about. That's what I do. How I got there was a little different, maybe. My career moved on, but the value of IT uh, and monitoring actually stayed in focus through an entire career that took me into two different CEO positions and still in focus for me today. 
And because of Nicholas, basically, he got me involved in the formation of the CA lab that you have here. Rutgers is the leading university worldwide on the subject of continuous auditing and assurance. My role in the last three years is to get them to move beyond that to continuous monitoring. And early on, they were less receptive to my thinking, and uh, more recently, they have become more uh, interested in it here. So, said, born in Brooklyn, no family wealth, lived in a one-bedroom apartment with two kids. My sister didn't fit the bedroom anymore, so she had to go upstairs with my grandmother for a little while, until we can go out and find some money to buy a house. We bought a house with no furniture in many rooms. It's actually really an interesting thing, because we loved it. I mean, we, we loved this house. It was just so fantastic. It had a dining room. Um, it had a den of a little porch. And, but we didn't have any furniture for the den or for the porch, and no furniture for the dining room for a long time. So you walk straight through the dining room for a couple of years. And when you get a dining room set, man, you really enjoy it. It's a, it's a very nice thing. They come slowly. So I went out to try to make some money. I, took some newspapers off the newsstand. The Daily News, believe it or not, at one point used to be 15 cents. And I would walk to Staten Island Ferry Line on Saturday and um, sell the newspapers for 15 cents. Pretty dumb idea, right? Nobody gave me 15 cents. Everybody gave me at least 25 cents. And some people gave me a dollar. And that's how I made money. Um, it was very interesting. I also sold greeting cards. I found out Ross Perot sold greeting cards when he was young. I think he turned out to be a billionaire, so I must have missed something along the way. But uh, my mother was a greeting card junkie, so she used to send every greet by greeting cards. The company that she bought the cards from, Wallace Brown, sent her a, a kit one day. She asked her if she wanted to be a salesperson for them. She gave me a kit. The margins were like 60, 70 percent. I started to sell reading cards to my family members, and at Christmas, Christmas cards, the big, big business. Met a friend who had a father who had an oil lab in Brooklyn, he used to sell olive oil. And uh, at Christmas, he used to sell gifts. So I took a couple of his gifts as samples, took them to my Christmas card customers, and added, uh, added Christmas card gift, that added gift line to the Christmas card. So I was kind of motivated to make money. If you ask me what I wanted to do at that point in my life, I had no idea. It was like, yeah, I wanted to buy a car someday, you know, the usual stuff. And, uh, uh, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And then I, an, an economics teacher in high school came in one day and said, ah, it's really kind of complicated, uh, macroeconomics and all that stuff. I'm going to teach it to you, but let's play a game while we're doing that. And the game was a stock market game. And once I got into that game, and we started to, you know, we gave each other probably a, a pot of money in. Maybe, you know, you made your investment choices, you looked at why you bought them, and you came back and discussed that. I liked it. So I kind of fell in love with uh, the markets there. And interestingly, I started to work at 13 dry, uh, riding a bicycle delivering groceries, which was no fun. Um, and, uh, uh, it, but I made money. I was actually making about $3 an hour. It's hard for you to relate to this. But, but the minimum wage at the time was $1.25. And Merrill Lynch uh, offered kids in my high school of jobs for $1.25, so another, you know, it looks like I'm doing math. I took the job at Merrill Lynch, took the cut in salary, and went to work on Wall Street. I was a, a junior in high school. That was really a big trip, was the late, uh, and Touche, which at the time was Haskins and Sells. Their auditors came in one day to do an audit, and I said, who are those people? And literally, the woman I was working for, whose name was Katie, said, them's the auditors. And I said, hmm, what do they do? And they were wearing suits and looked so sharp. And I thought, wow, maybe I should do that. So I decided to become a CPA, and I went to Pace University. I had to actually didn't sign up for college from high school. I, uh, in my summer after high school, I changed my mind, and I decided to go to college. I got recruited to Blair and Company, if you believe it, at a bar in Wall Street. A um, guy sitting next to me said, what are you doing? I told him. We talked a little bit, and he uh, hired me for three dollars an hour. So uh, I did get get back the money. Uh, well, we did get back into the money. As a matter of fact, my Wall Street job, I worked for four years for Blair Company when I was in college, and I was making in my last year the same salary as my father. There's two things to say about that: my father wasn't making a whole lot of money, and uh, I was. I bought a brand new sports car when I was a junior in college and helped my father buy a new car that, that same year. 
So now I'm at Ernst & Young, and they, they have this program called IT Auditing. And the word in the firm was, don't get involved with that, because people's careers go right down the drain, because nobody really knew how to evaluate the work that we were doing. So Andrew uh, was this, what, what you might call the, the next wave. We were the pioneers back in the 70s when we started to do IT auditing. It was career, it, it should be, like he said, there were these job openings with this much salary because they needed people, right? That's true. But in, a, in an accounting firm, which was very structured, and in some cases kind of dumb, right? They didn't understand that they needed to do it. <coughs> they still don't really get it that well. Um, and it's 30, 40 years later. So um, one of the problems was that your career path, when they looked at what you did each year, compared your experience to other people, they were looking at criteria like you knew about financial statements and you knew about tax. There was no, you knew about IT auditing, so it was a pretty dangerous thing to do. But I got recruited into it. They sent me away for some training up to IBM, and I became a, a, an IT auditor. This itch to be in management was, was still there. I wanted to be in the business. I didn't really like the idea of coming in and uh, you know, uh, looking at the business other people were running, I, I kind of wanted to be in business uh, for myself. So uh, I left. Uh, yeah, I was about to be made partner, and the company offered me a car uh, that was still doing that back then. And um, uh, they wanted me to come in and be a, their chief auditor. And uh, I, the only interview I ever went on in 10 years I was at Ernst & Young. Uh, but I wanted to get involved in the business, and but what you were talking about just at the end of Andrew's presentation, auditing is the most fantastic place to learn everything about the company, so I said, okay, I'll jump into that job. Uh, I left, they gave me a car, I had a Park Avenue office, um, I had a lot of money, I mean, I was making a lot of money, uh, I wasn't going to be a partner in the company, that was a pretty big, 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 big thing for me, the risk that I took. Um, but I'm not... I mean, that's one great career path for the rest of your life. Most likely, if all of you went to an accounting firm, like five of you will probably stay for the rest of your life. So um, it's, it's a decision a lot of people make believe. Um, I, I had this other business all the time. I started a company in 1969. I was in college as an investment company. So I loved Wall Street, and I said to my family members, sort of like, uh, Warren Buffett, but not exactly. Give me some of your money, and we'll invest it. And in the bull market of 19, late 1960s, I was able to pay everybody back their money, and we still had money invested in the company. So I, I dissolved it over the time because I, you know, I didn't really want to do that. I wasn't that kind of. A, that wasn't what I was doing. And it morphed basically into uh, money that I made ancillary to the other work that I did. So if you tax people, uh, you know, I tried doing tax returns for a year or two. I didn't like the ratio of work to revenue. And you do a tax return, you get paid. I like the idea of, like Andrew, start a company. It comes big, you can make a lot of money, right? So the leverage wasn't there. Um, I gave up that kind of uh, practice right away. But I thought about things like writing books, and I became the editor of a magazine, which was kind of central to uh, my staying involved with analytics. I, I took a job as the... Um, uh, editor-in-chief of the ISACA journal. And uh, that journal uh, kept me very interested in, in, the, in the space we have here. So, and it served me well because my company decided to move to Arizona. And I didn't really want to go to Arizona, although I had a great uh, offer to go as divisional president, actually. Uh, at the time, I was the CIO, if you can believe that, because I only really learned about technology by going to IBM and studying IT auditing. Uh, but it's not real hard uh, because you don't really have to know how to make the computer work. You have to know how to use it. So it's a you know, business person can run IT. I jumped back into IT auditing really directly into it at BDO Sleepman. And Andrew should thank me because we selected IDEA. Uh, we also let people use ACL, but we really, in the United States, focused on IDEA. Uh, in the UK at the time, uh, they were more interested in ACL. And I think Andrew understates the, uh, the significance of caseware's total package rather than one product, right? And their worldwide distribution. He said they have local employees only in North America, but through distributors, they're, lead, they're a leading firm in the rest of the world. Uh, in any event, uh, I went from BDO 
I got recruited to be a CFO of ATNA, and that's how I got into the fashion business, which was the favorite part of my life, 12 years. Uh, great, great, great job. Much more interesting than insurance uh, being in the fashion business. But I had knew nothing about it when I got involved in it. it. Took a couple of years, didn't think we made money the first couple of years. That's what I always tell people. But being the CFO is real hard when you're not making money. In, in good years, it's easier. Counting the money, you know, it's not that hard. Uh, when you when you have problems, that's where it, where it becomes difficult. That company got sold in 2004. Um, I had a deal. Uh, I tried to buy the company, but the terrorists that attacked the World Trade Center blew up our deal at the same time they blew up the World Trade Center. Uh, so I cut a deal with the board to stay, help them sell it. We doubled the value of the company in the next three years, which is the presentation I'd really like to be making Day, how we did that, and uh, and our bonuses and change of control deals uh, were all uh, driven as a percentage of the selling price of the deal. So if you want to remember anything about basic math, try to get paid for your success. Uh, so we made money. Um, I decided to go into my own practice again and not work for anybody anymore. That lasted for two years. I was making a six-figure salary uh, and killing myself. So I took the position of um, CEO of FEI, Financial Executives International. That put me on the, a lot of boards. I went on to the FASB board. Didn't really like the accounting pronouncement thing. If you could imagine me there, I was like, a, I don't know how they kept me for four years, but they kept bringing me back. And I would tell them, it's not about accounting, it's about the business. So I was the only one in the room talking like that, and I guess they decided they liked it, so they kept me. I was on the International Accounting Standards Board for two years. I was on the COSO board. Mostly this job really opened up my Rolodex. Uh, Washington with the SEC, a lot of things. Uh, and I was still just connecting business, IT, and whatever the, the, the nature of the work we were trying to do then. So I, uh, got, I had this big involvement with uh, professional associations along the way. Um, my role as chief auditor, while I think auditing is a great place to be, I didn't want to stay there for the rest of my life when I went to Ernst & Young, right? So now I'm chief auditor. I really didn't want to stay there either. Uh, in four years, we revolutionized internal auditing there. Why do I say that? Uh, sounds egotistical. Because what I was doing last year was I was going out and talking to other companies about how they should run their own companies. And the reason I was doing that was our directors were saying, um, how do you feel about your internal audit department to pick a company? They would say, yeah, you know, most internal audit departments are uninspiring. And uh, I, what I was doing was revolutionary because what we were doing was what Andrew suggested. We were being very much in sync with the business. What, how do we help the business? Not just how do we get through a year of doing more audit plans. Uh, so it was so interesting, that methodology, that I, when I um, got away from it, actually not until 1993 that I had time, but I took the methodology and uh, Wiley wanted to publish it. And then we did the first edition in 92. Um, in 90 something, we did the second edition. And in 2003, we did the third edition. In 2005, it came out in Chinese. And in 2013, Serbian. Anybody speak Serbian? I don't know who's going to buy that book, but they sent me a, they sent me a check. And I'm real, I'm real honored, I think. Uh, the Chinese was interesting, you know, about, you know, about China, and they gave me a, 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 an advance payment. And I haven't seen any money after that, because theoretically there's no sales. Uh, but the book is being sold in China. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the side business all the time. I uh, was involved with the Rutgers lab here. And now when I was retired for the real time, because I don't pick up that it's probably not going to take a full-time job anymore, I uh, went into... Um, uh, using a portion of my time uh, in this space. And the reason for that is, I'm just gonna connect the dots from the previous slide. The journal uh, work that I did at this magazine, you know, following it for 20 years, I was pushing it for 20 years. Uh, a lot of people thought I was too early in there, but Rutgers, uh, been involved with the lab here, um, about to become a senior fellow. Uh, a company called Approvo, which is post sarbanes Oxley Automation, came out and said, uh, asked me to be on their advisory board. Another company, uh, Oversight Systems, has me involved as an advisor, and most recently, um, I've been, become an advisor to uh, um, Caseware, which is a real exciting uh, uh, company. 
So basically, I travel around this year. A big thing I did was go to the Gartner, Intervention Gartner. I'm going to cover that. I'm going to skip some of my slides, but I'm going to cover what I see Gartner doing. So I, we were going to have a discussion here about how you see CA and CM, but I'm going to just tell you this. The speech I gave for the, about a year and a half involved me going around telling people that it's really time to move the chains here in football terminology. Uh, and I, and I uh, would say that using a limerick that I wrote about the Beatles, which you all wouldn't get because you don't know, but well, you probably would get it. Beatles songs are just so well known. I'm not going to do it here. Basically, the theme was automation is driving this eventually to where it's going to get to the point where you don't need auditors, but not exactly, right? We're going to automate the processes. And, and just like all accounting work has, it has moved up, the chain. You don't sit there and do double entry bookkeeping anymore. Uh, computers do that, but there's still a huge demand for accountants. The same thing's going to happen with monitoring. Right? I've been saying for the last year and a half that, uh, and, and Jason and some people have heard my speech three times, so they know it's been there, that there's an Orwellian interest in monitoring. And now we got the NSA in the United States proving it to everybody. But we also have in the newspaper every day articles about this that are talking about outliers and they're talking about companies that are doing monitoring. So they're actually pushing this, uh, uh, this theory into more of a common discussion. So what, what, if, if you went online, how many of you have actually gone online and Google CM, continuous monitoring? You would find that you get a whole page full of um, diabetes monitoring because in the medical profession, it's really pretty big. They use monitoring. Get, you get in an accident, they send you to your emergency room, they hook you up, start monitoring everything. This movie, how many of you have seen this movie? This is a young movie. Most of you, right? My generation has seen it 10 times because it's been, you know, it keeps coming back and every once in a while you watch it again. If you watch this movie, they're monitoring everything to do with, the, with that mission. Not only the medical condition of the astronauts, but where it is, the, the speed, they have to get that, uh, <clears throat> that rocket back. Ferro Express is the probably the most common example in most people, uh, daily lives. But it didn't exist. You probably don't know that. But 20 years ago, we didn't know where packages were. Matter you shipped something and you called people and said, did you get it? You know, there was no, nothing like this. And, and uh, that now has become the standard that every company has to follow. Uh, we expect to know where everything is. Uh, monitoring the weight when you check, you know, self-check out a, uh, uh, at, a, at a supermarket. Uh, so this is the summary. If I, if I gave that old speech, this is where it all leads. I give examples of the government. I don't have to anymore because the NSA put it in. I give some examples of medical monitoring. But then I say, in business, let's, let's break it out, right? Because you've been stuck in the IA mode, or the internal audit mode, you're thinking about it as you, know, as, as you would because you're going to be an accountant. But basically, if there's a huge amount of it happening in IT, uh, there's a lot happening in finance, there's a lot happening in segregation of duties in HR. And then in operations, that's the challenge. We're really trying to tee it up to get the operations people more interested in it. In terms of uh, basics, you all know this already, but continuous assurance is only the same, using the same kinds of software that people like Andrew invent uh, by auditors who are theoretically independent, right? And then if you take that same kind of software and use it in the business, it's called continuous monitoring. Now, where we are today, where you're graduating in 2013 in the big data world, right? Big data and data analytics is on everybody's mind. So when you go in your interviews and when you talk to people, I, I pepper in. You, you're getting a great extra piece of training here at Rutgers. I pepper that into my conversation because everybody really is very interested. This just says the same thing as the previous slide. So uh, my recommendations to the auditing world which I've written a bunch of articles in the last couple of years as part of a service to my uh, clients, is that auditors should be using as much automation as possible. Maybe I should leave that for a private slide for a second. Use your, you, use every tool you can get your hands on wherever you go in anything you're going to do, right? So it's, use any automated tool. Start thinking, how do you do this in an automated way on any task anybody gives you? 
And for those of you who are going to go to work for a public accounting firm, be prepared to be underwhelmed because they can, can they, for some reason, continuously do it the way they used to do it. And if you ask them, the partners will look at their paycheck and say, well, we're making a lot of money. This is working. It's OK. But if you come back to Rutgers and go to our CA summit meetings at the end of the year, you will, uh, in November, you would see companies that are looking to revolutionize the way auditing is done. It's not the accounting firm. Uh, ultimately, I think the accounting firms would probably buy them. So what we're interested in is, what I'm interested more in, is getting it into operations. Uh, now, rather than talk about the, off the slide, Andrew and I were at a meeting yesterday where the internal auditors have been trying to do that for five years, and they're not getting any take-ups on it. So they're saying, hey, we have this vision to you in operations and how you can do something better. And the operations people aren't listening to them, because why? Because they're auditors. They're, you know, they're like, okay, you go off and do your auditing and leave the business to me. But when you give them that idea, that's when you change the paradigm. So uh, that's what we did in, in our auditing practice. We almost, our whole focus was on trying to improve the business and, and improve the control environment. So a simple example, if you, if you were around when Easy Pass started, every time you went through a toll, you got a letter that said you violated something or you didn't pay. Or you, and then they, they honed that computer system where they figured it out. There's no chance that Jason could go through the Garden State Parkway toll on the way back to work today two times in 30 seconds, right? It doesn't make any sense. So if you, if you program a computer to look for that, right, and say, okay, let's kick those out, because obviously we don't want to charge this guy one time uh, in, in 30 seconds, uh, then we can reduce the errors. So people are starting to figure it out that you can use a computer. I had in an earlier example, a lady went to Mexico, lost her cell phone and, uh, in Newark Airport. And when she came back, she had a $2,000 bill from Verizon. And she, I shouldn't say Verizon, from a telephone. I really don't know which company. <laughs> <laughs> it was Verizon. It was a letter in the New York Times where I got this. And she wrote a letter to the New York Times saying, how stupid could a company like that be? My bill was $75 a month for the last 10 years. And now all of a sudden it's 2000. When were they gonna figure, I was, you know, my phone was robbed or something had happened. People are expecting it. I call it the Federal Express example because we are now expecting to know where everything is. Um, in IT, I said earlier, they're very advanced. They're looking at, uh, for viruses, for network breaches all the time, right? If you're probably not in that space, but they learned that actually from, uh, from being IT auditors early in their career probably. So a big thing I did in the last couple of years, I'm probably gonna go five minutes over, but it's really good. We did a big research project focused on CFOs. Uh, we looked at 14 companies, um, IBM, United Technologies, JCPenney, Microsoft, to see if they were using more monitoring than we knew about, basically, right? Because I'm saying it's happening. And we did. We found it. I mean, if you want to read the research paper, it's on the Rutgers website and on my website. Uh, you would see uh, lots of good examples. What's happening today, as new things pop up, uh, all of a sudden, the Farm Court Practice Act was one of my first speeches in the 70s in New York City, but nobody cared about it for the next 20 years. All of a sudden now, the Farm Court Practice Act is hot because the Department of Justice and the SEC are are going after companies if they make illegal payments in foreign countries. Um, what happened recently was Morgan Stanley was exonerated from, even though they, they had somebody in their organization made a, 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 an illegal payment, and they were exonerated on a, for a bunch of reasons, that they had a good system. They trained people, they, they reminded them about their training, but they also did monitoring. And they actually identified some transactions that were potentially um, illegal in their monitoring effort, and the SEC praised them for it and did not find them. So this is the kind of press, that positive press, that's getting people thinking of that monitoring is important. So let's jump into where the world is today. Big data and analytics, that's your world. Um, you've got it made because everybody's going to be looking to you uh, to, to see how you can bring this dimension to the business. So yeah, you're going to be in the early stages of your career. You're going to start doing auditing or 
or tax or whatever. Uh, by the way, the guy who started Caseware and became very wealthy, he started out in the tax area. But when they gave him a tax return to do, he said, man, this is really kind of rudimentary and boring. It could be automated. And that was the first business he sold before he went back to try to help accounting firms automate themselves. So that, that's been the theme. So the, the buzzword right now is uh, big data. And why? Because data is like growing you know, everywhere. All the social media and the rest of it has added to it. And they need to do something with it in the action words of business intelligence and data analytics now. So um, the evolution continues. Uh, yeah, uh, in terms of CA, 85% of the big Fortune 500 companies have some tool. Now, um, ACL, Caseware are in. They're in all those firms. When you see and read internal audit studies, they're not using them. They buy a, a software package, they use it once or twice, they go to an audit committee meeting, the audit committee says, are you automating the audit? They say yes, they did this. It's, it's uh, almost ludicrous. They, the, uh, when you get out into the auditing world, start using your imagination and start pushing this thing forward because it, it, it's, there's still a lot more to do. In terms of where it fits in the Gartner world, um, those are, this is where we need to work. Um, Gartner puts out reports. They made Andrew's product that he invented, Simshore, a successful product once it got recognized by Gartner. You all know who Gartner, or Gartner? It's a research company. And they basically, they get paid by CIOs, company, big companies paying $150,000, $200,000 a year to tell them what's going on. And they issue reports, so it's very important. So they, they um, um, I, when I went to that conference, I was trying to see where does this fit in the CIO's world. And the, the issue is it doesn't fit in the CIO's world if he's a nerd running the computer system. It fits in the CIO's world and the CFO's world if they get out of the finance and the IT and look at the business, right? So the business terms for where it fits are companies that are doing data mining. Some of this analytic stuff is data mining. Companies that are looking at data quality, because garbage data, you start making decisions on it, it's not very good. Right? We, uh, we at, at ATNIA, when I was selling shoes, uh, we started to do profitability reports by customer, by type of shoe, by color, by anything, and try to make more money. Yeah, so as a CFO, I sort of got into the business that way, and then became CEO. Pretty interesting. Uh, that's a better speed. Data warehousing, you know, parking the data. Um, business intelligence and analytics, a $5 billion business right now. Corporate performance is where I see it. I see this fitting into uh, corporate performance and business process improvement. So when, when you get out and go to work, somebody's gonna make you do a process, right? When you listen to Andrew's speech about his new product, Casework Monitor, which is an evolution from Simple, he has built in, um, process flow with, and, and automating the processes along the way. That's what all companies are interested in doing right now. Um, so anyway, that's the Gartner take on this space. When I was, this is I already told you, when I was in audit, I, the reason I wrote the, the book with these things, not too really dramatic, right? I figured out internal audit. We don't make anything, right? We have a bunch of people running around looking at stuff and they have to, come up with some interesting takes on this stuff. So we need good people. They thought, okay, so you gotta hire smart people. Same thing Andrew's trying to do. And you need to find people that, are, that think outside their skin. So we had uh, 25 people when I got there, and 23 of them left what, in my first year, because we wanted them to think, not just go to count things and tick things. Uh, but the, uh, so we also proceduralized it. That sounds crazy. But we made people do a process. We didn't tell them, you know, we couldn't get the ideas for them, but we teed it up in a certain way. And then we made them focus on this, significant issues and positive deliverables to the business. So everything that they did, they didn't go look at controls, but we told them within that context, we wanted them to uh, uh, find things that were rel relevant and would improve the business. Let me give you an example. And that it wound up being a book for me. So IT controls. I, I was around, I started to work before the invention of networks and the microcomputer. Hard to believe, but it was really crappy. Let me tell you. 
Uh, when the word processor came out at Phelps Dodd, uh, our secretaries organized themselves and said they would refuse to use it, a word processor. They were typing, and if they made a mistake, throw the paper out, start over. They were typing, and they didn't want to use the word processor. It wasn't easy getting to where you are today. They wanted to be paid more if they were going to use the word processor. That, that happened, and we said, my God, this is going to make your life so easy. Why wouldn't you just love it? They didn't understand it, right? So I, I was around before you had uh, the luxury of, uh, of met much, much of the technology. So w one of the things that happened when we started to put PCs on people's desks was data was like all over the place, right? I mean, we didn't have these things. But we had like floppy disks and other stuff. You had to worry about the company data. So the audit department would go audit and say, you didn't secure your computer very well. I could steal it. It wasn't locked up. We didn't secure your data. You didn't turn it off. You didn't use your password, right? That's what orders do. Go smack them around. You know, you, you could. What we did instead was we wrote a guide and we started training. And we took people in and said, here's what you're supposed to do now because this device is so easy to steal. So we thought differently about auditing. We said, we're, our job is to improve the control environment, not to go smack them around and tell them, you know, and then as Andrew said, then you go home and you think you're happy because you, you know, you found $3 million. Well, when you find that $3 million problem, then you want to go help the company fix the source of the problem, right? That's how you go from being an auditor, to being a CFO, to being a CEO, same thing. All the same thing. You want to sell more shoes? How do we sell more shoes? You want to sell more handbags to women? By the way, easy job. Easiest job in the whole world. <laughs> Selling shoes to women is the easiest job in the whole world. All you got to do is make sure you got a lot of black. That's one thing. Uh, so I would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to find out the color trends and then make more black. Uh, a lot of black. So I told the auditors, uh, use automation as a way to improve your business and drive the bottom line of the company. I'm going to skip that. that. Here's, the, here's the last slide. <clears throat> so automation has been the driving force in my career, even when I was selling shoes. Well, one of my best ideas was the uh, McDonald's combo meal for handbags. It was ridiculed, probably because I shouldn't have said McDonald's in the meeting, but um, I said, we're going to sell a woman a handbag, let's sell her the matching wallet, the matching keychain, put the price together, CPA in me. Okay, automation, that's not an automation thing, but automation has been the driving force. Take a step back, look at the business that you're going into, certainly look for ways to use uh, analytics, be creative, don't stop being creative, start being creative. That's what drove Andrew to be uh, an entrepreneur. Show your leadership, don't be afraid to step out. Um, Henry Ford, not impossible, just hasn't been done yet. People are gonna give you all the reasons why they can't do things. Um, in, uh, in our meeting yesterday, this company, big company, they were getting discouraged that they couldn't convince the other divisions of their company to uh, not use more monitoring. And Andrew said, you know, basically to them, over time, the other people will, will, will want it and you can help them in, install it. So you're in a good position, wish in a way I could trade places, but not really. So, <laughs> I uh, hope you, I hope this is a little bit helpful. You started to take a few extra minutes of your time. Thank you for having me.